before we get started, let me introduce myself and then Christian. Uh, my name is Kevin Arnold, and I am the director of the Life Sciences at the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, a few words uh, on how this session, uh, the topic, fits into the broader theme of our um, our seminar series on human flourishing and also into our funding and genetics. Um, if you've read Sir John's books or uh, our charter um, or the appendices of that charter, it's very clear that Sir John was interested in supporting work that increased uh, human flourishing along a number of different dimensions, certainly spiritually, as we've heard throughout this series, um, but also materially and, of course, um, their physical potential as well. Um, his interests in genetics um, were really aimed at what he called minimizing future poverty and sickness. Uh, and he expressed that enthusiasm through a variety of different fields. One of them was cancer research, um, looking at cancer prevention, as well as uh, gene therapy and, and other kinds of therapeutics. Um, that being said, the Templeton Foundations um, don't just fund any sort of biomedical work we're particularly interested in catalytic or niche funding where ideas or approaches have been uh, prematurely foreclosed on or they're undervalued or underappreciated both by the academy um, as well as by other funders. Um, as you'll hear here over the course of the hour, um, Dr. Tomasetti's work is directly responsive to this, the spirit of our funding. Uh, not only has he explored an alternative uh, model to the origins of cancers, um, but his work has led to a groundbreaking uh, diagnostic platform called CancerSeq, which now at this point in clinical trials has garnered over $480 million of funding to see it through all the way to completion. Although I should note that uh, Dr. Tomasetti hasn't seen a, a dime of that. Um, but also it has profound implications for how we fund cancer research on a global context. Um, in view of those um, rich uh, outcomes and potential for his work, he has secured three fund uh, grants from the John Templeton Foundation over the last five and a half or so years. Um, but let me introduce uh, Christian. He is an associate professor of oncology at the Johns Hopkins Division of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. Um, Though he's a very, I would say, in the early part of his career, uh, he's had a meteoric success by any metrics, and he regularly publishes in uh, alpha journals, that is the, the top impact journals that are in the academy. Um, over half, by my count, are found in Science and Nature, PNAS, and the New England Journal of Medicine, among others. Um, you can find out more about his work at his website, christiantomasetti.com. And he does have a forthcoming book coming out, which is entitled The Bad Luck of Cancer and Some Good News for You, uh, which explores also the theological implications of his work. And you'll hear more about that in this session. So uh, in my experience with him, despite his great success, uh, he's actually a very uh, humble person who's accessible and who is uh, dedicated to both his faith and his family, five children, he could also give a talk on how do you navigate juggling all those different responsibilities, uh, but not today. So Christian, welcome uh, to the Templeton Philanthropy Seminar Series, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for the very kind introduction. Um, so let me, first of all, start uh, sharing the slides. Um, yes, very, uh, thank you for the very kind introduction, and uh, thank you to the Templeton uh, Philanthropies for uh, having me and uh, talking to you. Uh, it's it's hard not to see you, but uh, hopefully you can see me and, uh, and, and somehow we can connect. Um, that to me is very important. So I'll talk today about the topic of luck and cancer. And uh, as Kevin just uh, mentioned, um, I'm working on a book. It's currently a manuscript. It doesn't have a contract yet, so it's still a long way to go but they will cover essentially the topics that I'm going to um, discuss today. Um, and so I'll start by uh, just uh, a very important fundamental question, uh, which is uh, what causes cancer? And um, there is a what I would call a classical view, uh, which is um, what we have um, known uh, until I would say at least 2015, this was really 
everything that was presented in the literature or on the major websites that provide information to the general public about the causes of cancer. And as you can see in this slide, um, the, the way we understood the causes of cancer was essentially a long list of environmental uh, or hereditary factors. And so environment, lifestyle, heredity. Uh, I call the environment and lifestyle the E factor and the hereditary factors the H factor for heredity. And so as you can see, obviously smoking, diet, so weight, alcohol, sun exposure, and several chemicals uh, that are known to be carcinogens. And, and, and similarly, uh, mutations that are inherited from parents, like the BRCA mutation, for example, increasing breast cancer risk. Uh, here is another example uh, from IRC. This is essentially the World Health Organization. This is the branch that does cancer research uh, for WHO. And here for each organ, uh, there is a list of the various factors that are associated to cancer. And so, the, you know, they are considered um, carcinogens, things that cause cancer. Um, here is another uh, publication uh, by the American Cancer Society in this case. Uh, this was right before a uh, study that we published came out, uh, essentially. And as you can see, when it talks about causes of cancer, it describes two major uh, factors. And then it provides on the right side, you can see they even provide some numbers saying the environmental factors account for an estimated 75 to 80% of cancer cases, okay? Uh, and the rest to heredity. So the picture was uh, very clear. In fact, here is also something that I don't find anymore on the Harvard website. Uh, I had to use the Wayback Machine to, to recuperate that, to recover that. But essentially, uh, this was a consensus statement given not just by Harvard, but you know, by a committee uh, that met um, to decide uh, basically what was the evidence in terms of the causes of cancer. And, and so this, as you can imagine, when scientists uh, gather together to make a consensus statement, they're extremely careful about the wording and what they are going to say to the public about the topic. Um, and so, as you can see uh, in, in, in that statement, there was this uh, associated uh, table where there is a long list of causes of cancer. And uh, many of them I'm sure you're familiar with. And one thing that's interesting is that uh, in, in that consensus statement, uh, it said that nearly two thirds of cancer deaths in the US can be linked to tobacco use, diet, obesity, and lack of exercise. And so as, as you can see from the numbers, in fact, if you add those three first rows, you get about the two thirds that, uh, that they are discussing. And so when you add them all up, it's 100% the total. And so this, um, you know, fits with the description of cancer being something that essentially has been figured out in terms of causes. And, and, and not just that, but that statement, the consensus statement said, you know, indeed cancer is a preventable illness. So the picture was very clear at that time. On the other side, uh, luckily we had some scientists like the Nobel Prize Michael Bishop that um, in a very well-known documentary, uh, uh, the Emperor of All Maladies on Cancer, which I recommend if you haven't watched that. And it's also, of course, based on a, on a famous book. Um, he stated that actually we don't know the causes of most of the major killers in cancer. And he was given two thirds as a ballpark number for that. And so how do we, um, you know, how do we put together this, the two things I just said? Uh, we had, uh, say, the establishment uh, and, and overall the field um, giving a certain message, but then there were scientists that uh, were somehow in disagreement. And so something major actually was missing. And so I'll describe now um, what uh, I think we, um, uh, we brought, we discovered that it's important in terms of understanding cancer causation. And so first to, to do that, I have to, first of all, um, tell you a second, what is cancer? And uh, because of time, and I want to cover quite a good amount of things, um, let me just be brief and say, you know, overall, uh, cancer is cells that are behaving in a, in a bad way. So they are proliferating in an unregulated way and invade other tissues. And what is causing the cells to do that is essentially uh, mutations. 
So DNA mutations, they make cells behave in ways that are not normal, okay? And we call the particularly bad mutations that are behind cancers driver uh, mutations because they drive the disease, like driving a car. And the, an example that I always use um, to explain um, what, what, you know, the way I, I see the problem is that, let's say we have to type something. And of course, if uh, the keyboard, um, it's broken, for example, in this case, it's missing, it's effective because it's missing the J key, um, then obviously when I'm typing, I'm going to make um, lots of typos because I'm missing a, a letter in this case. And this is comparable to the hereditary factors, okay? So I, I may be born with a bad mutation, so the one I just mentioned. Um, so this could be, say, BRCA mutation for breast cancer or so. And, and this is going to cause lots of mistakes in my body. Okay, so that's one source, which we estimate to be at around 10% of, you know, of all the mutations in, in cancer, if, if not less. Another um, source, uh, of course, of mutations is the environmental, the lifestyle ones. So think about smoking. And that can be thought, again, using this example of typing and trying to copy, let's imagine we're trying to copy in our DNA, which is 3 billion letters, so that's nine zeros. Um, so in that case, you know, the, the example would be someone that's tired, that hadn't had a good night of sleep or distracted. And so again, this uh, will cause um, the, type, the person typing to make mistakes that normally he wouldn't do. However, and, and we call those E factors for the environment. However, um, what is important is that there are typos that even if you provide a perfect computer, perfect keyboard, and, and even if the person is perfectly arrested, uh, that the person will make because we are human. And as human, nothing is, you know, 100% uh, perfect uh, in terms of, uh, definitely in terms of typing uh, as, as one example. And so, um, in fact, many claim that because of evolution, you have to have a small error rate uh, to enable evolution. In any case, uh, this is well known. We didn't certainly discovered that. Uh, but uh, to give you a sense of um, what, what is the actual effect of these mutations, sorry, the, the number of these mutations, uh, we estimate that about three to six DNA mutations occur every time a cell divides normally. So this is normal in our body. And so um, given, given this estimate, um, the idea came that maybe um, this cell division that's normal in our bodies and the mutations that occur because of that could be a major cause of cancer. And um, to give you a sense of uh, uh, the, the number of divisions, we have, of course, uh, say trillions of cells uh, in our body and um, uh, several billions of them uh, that uh, divide uh, essentially daily. And so it's an enormous amount of subdivisions and enormous amount of, of mutations accumulating in our body every day. And so if they happen to occur in the, in the wrong place, in a, bad, in a gene that's important for cancer, then that's how you can get to cancer. And so what we did is we thought, well, okay, if this idea is correct, we should be able to count how many cells an organ has, count how many divisions those cells perform in the lifetime of a, of a tissue, and see how that relates to cancer risk. And that's exactly the result I'm showing here for the 2015 paper, which is that when you consider um, the major cancer types um, and you look at on the x-axis here, how many divisions and cells those tissues have. So each point here is one tissue. And, and then you relate that to what is the risk of cancer in the lifetime of of that person, of that organ, uh, we were able to find a, a very large uh, correlation. Uh, in fact, uh, the co sorry, the correlation was 0.8. Uh, a very significant result, uh, not very common to find correlations this high in biology, especially. And, and so that explains, for example, why um, cancer of the colon is a lot more common than cancer in the bones, like osteosarcoma. So one of the reasons, that 
doesn't want to explain everything, obviously, but a major reason behind that is that colon self-renewed about every four days or so completely. The epithelial lining of our colon, it's gone and it's and it is, and renews. So think about the enormous amount of cell division and mutations occurring there. While, while for other tissues like bones, uh, the division rate is estimated to be uh, every some years or so. And so a much, much lower accumulation of mutations. And, and so this uh, brought us to conclude that uh, because of the statistical fact given by the correlation, that about two thirds of the variation that we observe in cancer risk Okay, so two thirds of the reason why some cancers occur a lot more than others, so the value on the y axis here, can be explained by the total number of subdivisions um, and, and, and therefore by the associated number of mutations that are just normal and due to R. So this was a result in 2015. And uh, um, because it brought this, uh, um, this R factor as a major player in cancer possession, and, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't essentially considered at all. Uh, there was, it triggered some controversies. And so I'll, I'll discuss those next. And, and I'll tell you something that uh, now when I think about it, it's, it's, uh, it's okay, it's almost funny, but at that time, I thought my career suddenly you know, was over because essentially, as you can see here, my, my paper came out on, uh, January 2nd, uh, I believe, and then about 10 days later, this is the World Health Organization and IRC, the, you know, their agency for research on cancer, essentially releases a statement uh, that uh, strongly opposes our, our findings, findings. And um, I don't have time, of course, to go through all the details, and, and, and there are other, of course, uh, criticisms, but um, I decided to focus on this because I would say it's potentially the most important. And, and their, um, their concern was, and, and the reason for criticizing us, was that we have done that study on the US population, and if we used other countries of the world, we would have found uh, different results. Uh, now, also, before I, I, I switch here from this slide, let me also just mention that this is press release number 231. I actually went back trying to find when, if ever, the WHO released any other statement against a specific uh, scientific study. And I, I didn't find any. I couldn't go all the way to number one, but I didn't find any. So this was, as I said, I thought, I thought my career was over. <laughs> um, so this was quite frightening for me. Um, the reason why they were saying that, that if we looked at a different population, we would have gotten different results is that when you look at the cancer incidence across the world, uh, this is the map from their website, um, you can see a lot of variation. And so some countries risk cancer a lot more than others. And, and, and to many, this is the proof that cancer is caused by the environment because you change environment, you change your risk of cancer. And this, by the way, this is overall cancer, but we could look at specific cancer types and the maps would be still very similar. So in some work that I still have to publish, we'll show that actually a lot of that map, the color of the map, which here are this, is the same map, I just changed the color to, you know, from white, yellow to red. Uh, once you consider what the data quality of that data is, and the data quality is a score that WHO provides themselves, they, they provide that score. Once you, once you consider that and you correct for that, actually the differences are not as large as you would think from the original map. But, uh, independently of that, what we did is at that time we thought, okay, well, let's check all the other countries. And so essentially we looked at uh, more than two thirds of the world population, all the cancer registries that were available. And the results were that the correlation was again 0.8. And in fact, all the countries fit into the confidence interval that we have provided originally. And so this was like a major confirmation of, of what we have found originally in 2015. Uh, and, and in that paper, we also went fur further by estimating um, if, if we had to say out of all the mutations that are found uh, in cancer and even that they are causing cancer, um, what is the we can attribute to these three fundamental etiological factors, so heredity, R, and the environment, uh, the numbers that we provided in this uh, study 
where the heredity was at about 5% and the environment at about a third, uh, 29%, while R, uh, you could attribute to R uh, two thirds of all the mutations uh, found in cancers. So this again was a major um, um, finding and in a sense really changing the way we, we think about what causes cancer. Um, this, um, while this was brand new at that time, there has been a lot of research since then. Uh, here is, for example, uh, one, uh, um, one paper I, I've been asked to write by science in describing um, several papers um, brought from the United States as well, England, the major sequencing centers in the world, the Broad Institute here, in this one example, and how today we have, in fact, proof that when you take a normal tissue, nothing to do with cancer, still healthy, uh, and you sequence it, uh, we find, in fact, a lot of mutations and, and even uh, several uh, mutations of the driver mutation types, so the dangerous ones. And so this is now confirmed to be the case. And, and uh, thanks to uh, Templeton funding, um, already this paper I just mentioned was, uh, was in fact, found essentially exclusively by the Templeton, but um, here are other studies uh, that we have done since then. This was published in 2020, where we show again that R can explain the incidence curves of cancer across different cancer types quite well. Um, here is another paper in 2021, actually, um, at the beginning of this year, where we develop a technique that can look at the signatures uh, the different factors live. So, for example, uh, when you uh, when you smoke, um, uh, you know the DNA is made out of four letters: it's C, D, G, A. Um, so it turns out that in a smoker, um, what smoking as a carcinogen will cause typically, or the most typical change, is that a, a C will become an A. And so when I sequence say the lung cancer of a smoker, I'll find a lot of places where it should be a C, but it's an A. And we call those mutational signatures. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but this is the basic idea. And so now we can use techniques to look at uh, essentially the signatures left by various factors in the, in the DNA, in the genome of a cancer patient. And, and what uh, turns out is that we are able to, uh, with pretty good uh, prediction uh, capabilities, to, to tell whether a person was a smoker um, without having to ask that question. It's just evident from, from what is left on the DNA. And so for several other factors, uh, whether it's sun exposure or obesity. Even. So this was published recently. And again, when we use this technique, to ask, okay, so out of all the mutations that we find in cancer, in cancers, what is the proportion that you could attribute it to R to this random replicative mutations? Uh, the answer was extremely similar, even though the methodology is completely different. It was again about uh, two thirds, uh, 69%. Um, okay, and then I just wanted to mention a bit, I think two more things about all of this uh, to say that since the original uh, controversies. Um, we also, also Harvard Epidemiology, for example, initially was quite against. They, they published a letter um, uh, in, uh, with respect to our paper. Um, since then, we've come a long way. Here is a, a paper where essentially we, uh, together with Harvard Epidemiology, uh, uh, Walter Willett, uh, he's a super famous epidemiologist, uh, we decided to publish this paper on having reached a consensus, essentially, that when we think about cancer and how you go from a normal tissue all the way to a cancer, there are indeed three major players. Uh, and, and we need to consider all of, all of this when we think about how, how to fight against cancer. And here is something that to me was also um, very important, which is I believe last year in the World Cancer Report, which is published by the World Health Organization, now they have a whole section in this cancer report that uh, it's now about um, this R factor and how 
the um, sum of cancer occurs in the absence of established or avoidable causes. So this was uh, important uh, for us to see that, uh, that we were getting to a point where the field overall agrees that uh, R plays a major role. Okay, so having, having said all of that, uh, I wanted to finish this first part that's uh, um, the, the one going over the scientific results, um, providing uh, what I think is uh, an op optimistic outlook. Um, uh, there, there are several books, and I mentioned the Emperor of All Maladies. They are really um, great books, uh, I suggest to read, for, for the history on how, you know, cancer research and what we have done and many of the mistakes that we have done and, and, and what has been good and what we are doing today. Um, one, of, one of the motivations for me to write this manuscript is that I feel we need a book that describes uh, the you know the forward looking picture and and i think um we have we can be optimistic with respect to that and, and i'll tell you in a second why so uh, one reason is very simple which is uh, the classical view based on you know the way we understood cancer etiology and the causes so the causes of cancer before say 2015 or so the classical view was that uh, if we wanted to defend ourselves against cancer, uh, we just need to essentially build the wall and protect ourselves, staying inside. And so, you know, uh, essentially not allowing things that we know are associated with cancer to enter inside, okay? And if you remember uh, the, the table from Harvard I showed you, that's exactly that type of picture, okay? I, am, I avoid those exposures, I'm going to avoid cancer. Uh, now, it turns out that because of you know, bringing R uh, into, into the picture, um, the, the, the problem is, as I wrote here, it's not internal. Sorry, it's also internal, it's not external. And so uh, secondary prevention, uh, and not just primary prevention, becomes important. And what secondary prevention means is early detection. Okay, so if we cannot avoid uh, some cancer to occur, we can at least find it early. And, and let me show you just some numbers for why, uh, to convince you of why that is important. Here is, uh, for example, the survival at five years after a diagnosis with cancer, depending on the stage the cancer was a diagnosis, okay? And so as you can see, if the cancer, say a breast cancer was still localized, uh, the probability to be alive after five years since the day of the diagnosis is 99% currently, okay? And that probability goes down to 27.4% when the cancer is found in stage four, which is a late stage where the cancer has essentially metastasized already to other regions of the body. Um, very similar uh, when we look at prostate cancer. So, so we have essentially 100% survival at five years. If it's in stage one or so, it uh, becomes about 30% when we go to a distant stage. And here are a few more, uh, like colorectal cancer. And I wanted to show lung cancer because, um, you know, even, even in lung where the, uh, essentially the probability of survival when it's found uh, in metastasis, it's, it's extremely small, about less than 5%. Uh, it makes a major difference if that cancer can be found in stage one, okay? So having said that, um, well, actually, let me first uh, say, having said that, I think one important and positive news of these findings is that, you know, on one side, someone can say, what kind of good news is to say that we have discovered that some cancer is unavoidable? And, and I agree, of course, that's, that's a, a major challenge. But I think it's always good news when we can actually discover the truth, because when you discover the truth, you can, you can do something about it, okay? Um, you, you can change the way you approach how you tackle that problem. And so I think that's always good news to have this, you know, to discover the truth. Um, now, another reason why I think uh, this is um, good news uh, looking forward is that um, uh, this research 
has contributed to put more stress on the importance of early detection. And uh, I, I've been working uh, with Dr. Vogelstein and, and, and there are other groups, of course, uh, now doing this. Uh, the, uh, this is very exciting. It's a, it's a brand new, but very important direction in reducing cancer mortality, which are these liquid biopsies for cancer early detection. And so what, what we do with that is uh, we um, and others have done studies showing, um, this for example was already published in 2014, showing that when a person has cancer, some of the DNA from that cancer, from the cancer from the tumor cells is shed uh, in the blood, it's in circulation. And, and it has been shown that we very, um, sophisticated techniques, uh, we are able to detect the presence of that DNA, okay? And, and the blood is full of DNA from other cells that have nothing to do with the cancer. So it's a very small signal, okay? Often uh, only say one every thousand uh, fragments of DNA may be attributable to cancer. So it's a, it's a, it's a quite a challenging game. But it, it's been shown that in fact we can detect it. And so using these techniques, um, and in fact, not just in blood, but also in other liquids, that's why we call them more generally liquid biopsies. We have shown, um, here is one example with pap that we can uh, detect um, um, ovarian and demetrial cancer, um, or uracic, looking at urine. Uh, we have shown that it's possible to detect uretelial cancers. And, and um, maybe the, the largest and broader study, uh, what Kevin mentioned, cancer sick, which is, um, we shown that by looking at the blood and the signal I just described, both in terms of DNA and in fact, even also adding proteins and, and today a lot more uh, you know, of other variables too, uh, we are able to um, find cancer uh, pretty early. So here is the example from this paper, which was a bit more than 40% at stage one, which bumped to you know, more than 70% at uh, stage two and, and so on. And because this is an essentially a non-invasive test, it's a, it's a blood test that you can imagine being performed once a year or even every six months at the doctor's of, office. Um, this is uh, very exciting because uh, when you look at these uh, numbers, um, today, for example, for, um, for the first five of the eight tissues that are depicted here, there is really no uh, screening currently uh, available. And so when you see that test is able to detect with this type of sensitivities uh, across the board, uh, this is very exciting. And so um, um, Kevin mentioned uh, one company that is born out of Hopkins using this type of technology. Um, and there are now several others. Uh, as I said, this is very exciting and, um, and there are lots of investments currently in this. In this. And I, I think that, uh, well, based on what I know, um, I think some of this test um, potentially already in a year or two uh, may be available on the market, uh, maybe not paid yet by insurance companies. Uh, for that, we have to wait you know, the end of a very long sequence of studies um, but uh, maybe so, maybe three, four years. I think this is going to change uh, in an incredible way, uh, the mortality rate that today we have because of cancer. Um, and here, just to mention that these techniques can also be used for detecting um, recurrence. So for patients that have cancer and have had, say, surgery, uh, we can use blood, a blood test, just to keep checking whether the cancer is coming back or not. And so in this way, find the, essentially a lot earlier than, than you would otherwise. And in, in that way, you, you can attack it a lot earlier and, and, and do better. Okay, so this was, um, what I will say is the, uh, the scientific component of, of my presentation. I wanted to have a last part on what all of this means. And uh, I may have to go a little bit faster because I see that uh, time is running fast. Um, but I wanted to discuss what does this mean to us? 
Um, and so these papers that I mentioned, especially two of them, caused a really major reaction in the, in the media, in the general public. Um, and just to give you one number, uh, the 2015 paper uh, for, for the year in which it was, pub it was published, it was uh, the number four paper across all papers of any field, of any journal. In, in, um, so really a, a huge um, interest and reaction. And I, I want to tell you, just show you uh, some of the, uh, of the things that we received uh, as messages, usually emails. Uh, I won't read them all, but um, essentially, you know, we had uh, religious people um, reminding us how God does not intervene in the universe, that that is the position among most modern Jews. Um, you know, we had insulting emails. Um, we had uh, we had others that um, were happy to see, uh, you know, that uh, what the findings were, and and they were explaining um, the reaction of some of the general public as essentially, you know, uh, originated by the fear of what is uncontrollable, and so the fact that people usually rather uh, attribute cancer to you know the fault of something rather than to what we call bad luck or are um, one of my um uh you know one of my favorites uh was this one uh the title uh your Astra made me cry was really touching to me uh, this gave me so much motivation actually in that very moment as you can see, this was just a few days, a week after the WHO released that statement against, against uh, the paper. Um, and so this is a, a well-known Australian hematologist. Uh, and um, you know, he says, when they were trying to figure out what it was, the, the doctors followed, uh, you know, went through blind helis of lost family were considered and chased, um, genetic testing considered and sister upon out, out of fear. Um, and so on. Um, so I also think that um, for someone like, uh, for example, a parent uh, that has a child diagnosed with cancer, um, this also, uh, emotionally speaking, it's, it's good news uh, because I cannot imagine, uh, I, have, I have children, as Kevin mentioned, I cannot imagine if one of my children had been diagnosed with cancer and I went online to check what caused that. And all I could find was that essentially it was my fault. Either I exposed my, my child to something or, or I passed some bad gene to, to that. So, okay. I wanted to um, discuss a few uh, points. The first one is um, I'm, I'm religious. Uh, I, I, believe, I believe I have a strong, very strong faith in God. And, um, and some people have our time thinking that, you know, God would play dice with the universe and that things like cancer could be uh, random. Now, it doesn't always have to be random, right? If I, if I smoke, uh, my priority to get lung cancer, it's, it's very high um, with respect to the general population. But, but in general, how, how do you put these two things together? And right from the start, um, when we release an explanation to the criticisms, the very subtitles, you know, this, this part here of that article, um, we decided to cite a scripture, okay, to address specifically that point, where we wanted essentially to say, look, that based on our understanding of scriptures, in this case, the Bible, um, uh, God uh, you know, would send sun and rain on both the just and the unjust. And so this idea that if I behave well, um, I will not get cancer, and it, it's, it's wrong. Uh, this is not, um, even doctrinally, I don't think it's, um, it's well supported. Um, but uh, what I wanted to, to, dis to discuss a bit more was, you know, how do we make sense of the uh, cancer diagnosis. Uh, and um, so this makes me think about a very well-known uh, Buddhist, Buddhist um, story of, of Kiza, uh, whose child uh, dies and, and um, you know, she, she, uh, she prays and Buddha says to go and collect the master's seed 
uh, in, in the village for every house where essentially there, there has no been death. And of course, she goes and she realizes that everyone has had that. And, and uh, so everyone is, is losing someone. Um, and I know I'm speaking about something that is, has touched all of us um, and, uh, and, and in profound ways. So we, we are definitely talking about uh, a terrible disease. And um, there is, uh, if you want the scientific answer to it, uh, which is important, of course, and uh, the scientific answer is that cancer is a natural evil. It's essentially a byproduct of life. And similarly to you know, earthquakes or uh, tsunamis or COVID-19. And uh, some of this is explained as you know, a system that, uh, for example, when you think about earthquakes, right, uh, you have an equilibrium and once in a while you have to release some of these energies to then stay and uh, keep that equilibrium and, and so on. So the scientific answer is very simple. It's a byproduct of life. There is nothing we can do about it. And in fact, uh, I'll present kind of two points of view, opposing points of view. One I'll call it naturalistic, uh, which is that uh, essentially we are in, living in a world that because it's undergoing evolution via these random processes, uh, these processes don't really care about us. And so as Richard Dawkins family said, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Um, you know, DNA doesn't care about us. And so um, um, here, uh, this, this is a very typical position, I would say, among uh, many scientists, uh, if, if, if they are not naturalists in, uh, in spirit. So here is another example by Stephen Hawkins. Um, in fact, uh, uh, the picture is very grim overall, I would say. Um, here is a famous quote by Stephen Hawking where, you know, the universe is described as a violent place and how essentially it's almost inevitable that, um, you know, we'll be all gone. And in fact, he puts even a number. He thinks it's very reasonable to think that we won't be there in, in about a thousand years or so, which is a very short amount of time, actually. Um, and here is another one. Uh, I absolutely love Carlo Rovelli and his research. Uh, so I have a pretty profound respect for, uh, for the scientist. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he says again that he doesn't believe our species will last long. Um, he says we, we believe to a short-lived genus. All of our cousins essentially are already extinct and we do damage. And, and then he says uh, in one of his books, um, and I, I find this really telling for, for this naturalistic point of view, which is we're born and die as the stars are born and die, both individually and collectively. Life is precious to us because it is ephemeral. And, um, and so I would say from a naturalistic point of view, the answer to you know, cancer and its sufferings and, and all of this is uh, this is just the way nature works, and the beauty of life is in the ability of catching this uh, very brief moments of beauty that we can catch, and that's exactly why we appreciate it. Um, I don't, I personally, of course, don't agree with that. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, someone that loses a child, for example, I mentioned here, Nick Cave, uh, he, he lost his son, he fell from a cliff and, and wrote the song. And I, I really like how, how you, he expressed the pain of essentially, you know, the very moment that you get attached to a person. And so he talks to his son saying, attach yourself, to, you know, his son attached himself to his heart. It was a kind of dying because the very moment that you do that and I, I get attached emotionally to another person, uh, essentially, you're already, uh, you, you know that that part of you is going to die because, you know, both of you one day will be gone from, uh, from a touristic point of view. There is nothing going to be left there. And so this, um, um, this very, um, in, my, in my view, very bleak uh, views of, of life 
And, you know, I, I think about my son, my youngest is now eight year old, uh, Giovanni, and he is um, uh, regularly, I would say, every, every few weeks uh, when he falls asleep in bed, uh, he will ask me, um, Dad, um, he, I, he's trying to figure out how long I'm going to live. And so he says, Dad, I, I just so is it, is it true that, you know, people can live even to 200 years old, right? And uh, do you think you, is, is, is that what is going to happen for you? And, and he's calculating that, right? And so this, this is like obviously uh, um, touches anyone uh, on earth in a, in a very deep, deep way. So I just wanted to conclude uh, providing one or two points, I hope uh, some of it may be useful. Um, of course, I, I believe um, uh, in God. And uh, I wanted to say one, one statement uh, that to me is dear is this one, that you know, many people today uh, leave religion and often the presence of moral, and in fact, natural, even worse, evil, is used as a justification for that. And when I actually think that, it, in a sense, it's, um, um, you know, that, that, that to me, it's amazing because in fact, the very existence of God is the only hope we have for a solution to that problem. And um, so uh, as a scientist, of course, I believe in the existence of absolute morals and ultimate justice and the fact that the universe has deep meaning. And when, when I think about sufferance, um, um, here's what I want to say in my last few minutes is the suffering is um, necessary for our growth. And it's certainly, um, it's bitter uh, in many moments in our life uh, when we go through it. Uh, at the same time, it teaches us about compassion, and empathy, and love, and priorities, and our limits. And uh, those moments increase uh, our focus and, and our understanding of what really matters most. And our thank you, Christian. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I want to leave some time for us to have oh, yeah. uh, a Q&A with our audience. Okay. Um, at this time, we're going to stop the recording. Okay. And we'll transition. Sure.